Well, good morning. Wonderful to see everybody here this morning. We're starting a new study this morning on the Gospel of John. And uh, so as is our uh, custom, I'd like to begin that with prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the God who has spoken, uh, who has intervened in human history, uh, throughout who, human history, and who has ultimately um, broken into human history uh, through the um, earthly ministry of your son. Would you bless us with open minds and hearts as we approach this very special gospel uh, and learn uh, how to interact with you and how to ultimately uh, be your people. It's through your son that we pray. Amen. So we're going to spend a little time this morning just kind of getting introduced to the fourth gospel. And uh, we're doing all of this in part because Troy is going to be preaching through the Gospel of John starting in January. And so we're sort of tilling the ground in preparation uh, for that. And one of the things he wanted to do was to have us respond to uh, some questions that aren't normally um, accessible from the pulpit. You, you can ask questions from the pulpit and get a few responses, but it's not quite as interactive as this environment is. And so <clears throat> we're going to start by asking the question, why, why a fourth gospel? We had three perfectly good gospels. Um, why do we need a fourth one? And, and Troy's primary question was, and why is there no birth narrative? I wanted another birth narrative, you know? I wanted a little baby in a manger with some animals around and all that sort of thing. And, there's no birth narrative in John. That's, yeah, I'm disappointed. But um, uh, let's think for a moment, uh, just a little thought experiment. Imagine yourself as a judge uh, in a courtroom, and you have a case before you. Would you rather have one witness, or would you rather have more than one witness? You want to have more than one witness, right? Why? Okay, to verify the truth, Ben? There you go. Yeah. So you want to get people's, different people's perspectives because you know those perspectives are going to be different from one another, right? And providing multiple perspectives allows you to understand more. It allows you to identify people who may not be telling the truth. Their story is radically different from the other stories. But multiple witnesses from the very foundation of legal system, and by the way, in the Mosaic Law, uh, are always the rule rather than the exception. In the Mosaic Law, if you had one witness, did you have any witnesses? Nope. One witness was not reliable. had to have at least two. Okay? So we had, at this point, three witnesses. We're going to go through those witnesses right quick. Matthew is a Jewish gospel. Let's see, I suppose I could use my slides since I spent all that time making these. <clears throat> Each of the four gospels is distinctive. Each has a distinctive target audience and a distinctive pur purpose. And uh, so we're going to consider the, the three gospels that were extant when uh, John wrote his fourth one. Uh, Matthew, distinctly Jewish gospel, Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Can you get any more Jewish than that? We're not going to refer to him as the Christ, the Greek term. Uh, we'll use the Jewish term Messiah. And then he's the son of David and the son of Abraham. And what comes in verse 2 and forward? A genealogy. Right? We're going to have every single person in that genealogy tracing him all the way back to Abraham from whence comes the promise uh, of God and f through, uh, which, or through whom uh, comes the authority to be who he says he is. We know that uh, the Messiah is going to be not just a child of Abraham but a, a child of uh, Judah. And, uh, and other prophetic uh, threads that run through all of that. So Matthew is very focused on the Jewish um, uh, approach, uh, and, and he makes a distinctly Jewish witness uh, to uh, the gospel. 
and so he emphasizes Jesus as the fulfillment or the completion of the Mosaic law. You do not see Matthew telling stories about Jesus breaking the law. Rather, you see Matthew telling stories that talk about Jesus fulfilling prophecy, being just like what the Old Testament said he was going to be, and uh, doing all those things just the way they were supposed to be done. Uh, he assumes, and this is important, he assumes that, it's, that his readers or his listeners, most of these people would have heard this read rather than having a copy of it. Can, can you imagine how blessed we are? <laughs> how many of you have more than one Bible, right? How many of you have a half a dozen Bibles? Oh, yeah, absolutely. How blessed is that to have that kind of access to God's word. When Jesus walked the hills of Judea, if you had something in written form, you were something really special. You were probably a priest in the temple. You were possibly a Levite. You may have been a scribe, but whatever you were, you were something really special. How blessed we are to have this kind of access. But uh, Matthew is going to assume that we uh, understand the Torah, the, the five books of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Uh, he is going to assume that we're more or less familiar with the Levitical law and that we have at, at least a, a glancing relationship to the prophets. And you're going to see in Matthew over and over again, uh, Jesus referring to the law and the prophets or Matthew as narrator referring to the law and the prophets. And from those, we see a strong foundation on which Jesus' ministry is built. And ultimately, we see the conclusion of that ministry in the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. So that's Matthew. Mark, probably the first gospel. I can debate about that. But uh, Mark is, um, I, I call Mark the Joe Friday gospel. It's just the facts, ma'am. It doesn't bother with the birth narrative, doesn't bother with any of that stuff. It just goes straight into John the Baptist. In about three verses, John the Baptist is done, and he's straight into the ministry of Jesus. Uh, and uh, there, there's lots of debate as to whether Matthew and or Luke were dependent on Mark's gospel as a source for their stories. I don't think that it really matters all that much. The point is they're all written about the same time, and they're all written to radically different uh, audiences. Mark is clearly just i got to get this story out. It's important that it be written down, and it's important that it be distributed, and I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking deep thoughts. We're just going to tell the story and get it out. Okay? So that's what that one's about. Ben? Absolutely. Absolutely. Ben's point is well taken. Uh, ultimately, this is the work of God through his Holy Spirit uh, inspiring these words. And uh, we're going to have more to say about that because John, in his gospel, talks about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit um, a great deal more uh, than the three synoptics. So then on to Luke. Remember Matthew's nice little terse um, first verse? Mark's terse first verse is, well, it's hard to say that three times. Mark uh, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Any questions? Right. Really just succinct. Look at Luke's first verse. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. Uh, that makes Paul look terse by comparison. <laughs> but this is a decidedly Greek gospel, and it is written in the form of a Greek history. So all Greek histories from this time, and really for the last couple hundred years before Luke comes on the scene, have this kind of a flowery, all-encompassing, uh, broad-ranging introduction. And generally speaking, they have a person to whom it is addressed, usually a person of some uh, power and, and note. 
Uh, so in this case, it's addressed to Theophilus, which may have been a real person, or it may be uh, the the God loving uh, uh, the God loving audience to whom uh, Luke was addressing. Theophilus just means Theo God, Philo love, uh, and so it's a, the lover of God. Uh, but this is this is the essential Greek history, and it is the virtual opposite of Matthew, where Matthew is going to focus on everything Hebrew. Uh, Luke is going to focus on everything Greek. He's going to uh, he's going to tell roughly the same stories as Matthew and Mark, but he's going to tell them from a, a unique perspective, and he's going to be quick to point out every time Jesus plays fast and loose, or seems to be playing fast and loose with the Mosaic law, because from Luke's perspective, Jesus is not just fulfilling the, the Mosaic law, he is, but he is also turning the existing power structure and the existing thought process for how we interpret the Mosaic law on its head. He doesn't change the law, but boy, does he throw out every means of interpreting the law that, the, that his contemporaries used. You, you raise up to the level of scripture the commandments of men, and uh, Luke just won't let that theme go. He's also uh, by far the gospel that has the most women in it, the most underprivileged uh, people in it, the most uh, marginalized people. Those are all people that Luke loves to populate his gospel with. Uh, so it's wonderfully detailed, a lovely birth narrative for both John the Baptist and Jesus. Uh, he maintains the methods and values of the best histories of the time. We tend to look at these four Gospels through the light of 20th and 21st century historians. That is not good because we, we bring values to that that just weren't there uh, in the first century. Uh, but Luke is probably the closest thing to a, a true history that we would recognize as history. Uh, in the early 21st century, uh, extremely well-researched. And every time an academic thinks they have found a mistake in Luke, they always turn out to be wrong. <laughs> so uh, for a long time, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the birth narrative for Jesus, and Quirinius wasn't governor. We don't have any record of a Quirinius as governor anywhere. Eh, yeah, it turns out we did. We just hadn't found it yet. So, so why... When we've got three perfectly good Gospels, why do we have a fourth one? And why so much later? All of these Gospels are probably written around the 50s, mid-50s, maybe early 50s. Um, and, okay, so uh, Day of Pentecost, roughly 30. Do we have a question or comment? Fred, did you have some? Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, the, Fred's pointing out that the chronology in Luke is different than the chronology in Matthew. That's one of those things that we tend to think of as 20th and 21st century, even 19th century history, should be in chronological order or have some sort of explanation uh, as to why it's not in chrono order. Uh, in the first century, chronological order was not a big thing. And so, yeah, you'll find stories seemingly out of order uh, higher critical scholars are all over that. Oh, well, that means there was an editor, and this editor decided it was this, and that editor decided it was something else. And uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the stories are told with a purpose, and they're told in the order that they're told for furthering that purpose. Matthew tells stories that are focused on the fulfillment of the Mosaic Law, and he tells them in a particular order in order to strengthen his case that Jesus is the Messiah. Luke tells them in a different order because he has a different objective and a different audience. So, uh, yeah, chrono order is something that we would like to have. Uh, we don't have it, and we got to get used to it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of discussion on the genealogies. The Matthew genealogy definitely runs through Joseph uh, and, and lists him as Jesus' earthly father. 
uh, makes the distinction, of course, uh, an important one. Uh, Luke's genealogy it has a little fuzzier and grayer. Uh, the theory has always been that it traced uh, the genealogy down through Mary's uh, lineage, a most extraordinary departure from common practice. Nobody traced uh, women's uh, genealogies back then. But uh, however that works out, again, this is history for a purpose, and uh, Luke's uh, genealogy is, is populated with all sorts of interesting and colorful people uh, that he wants to integrate into uh, the lineage of Jesus. And uh, we're just going to assume that uh, God's Holy Spirit knew what he was doing when he put that together. So, uh, Other comments? All right, back to John. Uh, why do we need a fourth gospel and particularly uh, such a radically different gospel? Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels, sin with uh, optic uh, to see. So uh, seen together, they look at uh, mostly the same stories, uh, very little difference in, in how those uh, stories are, are put together, but obviously uh, characterized in different ways uh, for different audiences. Uh, and then here comes John, and he starts out completely differently. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, just a radically different way of approaching the gospel than, uh, than, than the three. Uh, Mark, who just jumps into the deep end. Uh, Matthew, who starts with the, with the invocation of the word Messiah. Uh, and Luke with this flowery Greek uh, introduction that makes it clear that he's, he's writing a history. Uh, here comes John, and he's going to start in the beginning. Sound familiar? Sound like Genesis 1-1? Yeah. John, I think, and, and, and the, the scholarship is fairly united on this thought. Uh, John's gospel and John's revelation and undoubtedly John's uh, three epistles uh, are all written in the 90s. Um, these Gospels, the, the synoptics are written in the 50s, probably, certainly no later than, than early 60s. Um, and so you've got this gap in time. You've got your first generation Christians that came up through uh, the day of Pentecost and out of that uh, watershed event. Uh, and then they have kids, and uh, some of those kids are in the church and, and some of them wander as, as children do. Uh, and, and then there's an influx, a constant influx of new people. So your second generation people are the ones who are reading the gospels who were not old enough, probably weren't even born back when Jesus walked the earth and when his, his disciples followed him around and learned from him. Their primary source now is the three synoptic gospels. Now we've got a new generation beyond that. These are grandchildren of the Pentecost people. And so not only were they nowhere close to walking the earth when Jesus did, uh, but they don't even know anybody. Grandpa and grandma, you know, uh, are getting on in years and, and maybe they've already gone on to their reward. I don't know anybody who walked with Jesus. Now you've got this special situation because John is the last or certainly one of the last, as far as the early church is concerned, John's the last living, or last living apostle of the, of the original 12. Now you can imagine him in his 90s, probably in Ephesus, that's where uh, the, the historical record uh, has him near the end of his life, uh, and every Sunday, a group of people gathers around him and says, John, Tell us what it was like to walk with the Savior, to be in his presence. To, wh what stories can you tell us that aren't in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Uh, it, are, there, are there things that happened that we don't know about? And can you just imagine John saying, man, there's a lot of stories <laughs> that aren't in the synoptics. And, well, maybe, maybe I should write a fourth gospel here much later, he has the perspective of all these decades. And by the way, while he has been uh, getting that perspective, he is also watching the church change, right? Uh, 
The people who walked around Jesus, how many of them were great theologians? Rulers of the Jews, not very many. Uh, deep thinkers, probably not a lot. But starting with Pentecost, all of a sudden the church gets really big and really diverse. And it happens just boom, overnight. They go from maybe a few hundred to thousands of people uh, across the whole spectrum. So now here's John in the 90s, and he's looked at a church that has developed and changed and flowered. He's seeing people who, who are second generation and third generation Christians who are deep thinkers, who have some, some academic background and who have the capacity to, to ask bigger questions than the first century church asked. And that's when you start getting the, the beginnings of questions about what it means when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. What it means when Jesus says to, uh, that uh, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What, what, is, what does that mean? And so John takes this gospel as his opportunity to start at the very beginning and say, in the beginning was Hologos, the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. How can this be? <laughs> How can you be with God and be God at the same time? How can God be wherever he is and Jesus be here on earth praying to him and still be <laughs> truly God? And the church started asking those questions more specifically right around the time that John wrote his fourth gospel. And so he begins with a, with a thought framework within which those questions can be answered. In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God, that is separate from but related to God. And in some way that defies human understanding, and certainly defies Aristotelian logic, Aristotle just rolling over in his grave, you can't be both, you gotta be one or the other, right? In some way that we don't understand, the Word was with God and the Word was God, and John just will not let that go. <laughs> he wants you to deal with the tension of two things that seem like they can't exist in the same space, and yet they do. And he wants us to do that because God, from the very beginning, has been beyond our comprehension. Now that he has expressed himself through his son, he's really beyond our comprehension. And his son is going to introduce the Holy Spirit, who has been clearly visible throughout the Old Testament record, but now all of a sudden, he's going to indwell each of us. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How can this be? And so I think it's, I think it's important that John's very first story of Jesus interacting with a seeker in the third chapter of John, the very first thing out of Jesus' mouth is so incomprehensible. What does Nicodemus say? How can this be? <laughs> can a man be born again? How, how, you know, what are you, you're talking nonsense here. And Jesus says, wrap your mind around it because it's true and because it's giving you a headache, that's a good sign. It's a sign that you're starting to deal with, number one, your own limitations. Your thoughts can only take you so far, and at that point, you're going to have to just make a leap of faith. And number two, you're starting to ask the right questions instead of being so focused on, have I made a check mark next to each and every Mosaic law? Now you're starting to think conceptually, starting to think big picture, starting to think in the way that God wants his people to think. So <clears throat> I think that's uh, why John, or primarily why John um, uh, writes his fourth gospel and his decidedly non-synoptic uh, gospel. Uh, it's, uh, I, I feel strongly, by the way, I have a new favorite, uh, um, I'm buying commentaries by the pound now. <laughs> it's a, if you, after you read it, you can you know, pump, uh, pump paper. Um, the new favorite uh, high-level commentary here by a guy with the rather comical name of Edward W. Clink III. Uh, 
a top-level scholar who nonetheless believes that John the Apostle wrote the Gospel of John and the Revelation and the three epistles. He's not a, he's not a radical, nobody wrote anything that, that they said they wrote uh, kind of guy. And I'm just in love because he's, he's got the depth uh, that I don't have, but at the same time, he sees past all the academic falderall into what's really true and what's really spirit-inspired. So I'm in love. Um, so John the Apostle, the elder statesman, the last of the 12, wrote it, and it maintains Matthew's Jewishness and Luke's Greekness. So John is a, is a great melding uh, point for, for those two approaches. We're going to do a quick review of, oh, there was one other thing that I didn't put in the notes, but that I wanted to point out. Uh, in addition to serving a third generation uh, church, uh, John's gospel, I don't know if he knew that this was going to happen or not, but John's gospel served as an apologetics course for the third, fourth, fifth generation of churches that were going to begin to be persecuted about that time. Um, John writes the Revelation um, while in exile on the uh, Isle of Patmos, and he is in exile because a guy named Domitian is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, emperor in Rome. Domitian's a wacko. Uh, he makes Nero look uh, almost nice by comparison, uh, and, uh, and he, imp he starts imprisoning Christians uh, on, on the pretext uh, that they are, number one, atheists because they won't uh, proclaim uh, Jupiter and, and Mars and all the other uh, Roman gods as gods, uh, but number two, because they won't claim uh, Rome as, as, their, um, as the, the ultimate power. And the reason that persecution starts is there are cracks beginning to form in the uh, foundation of the Roman Empire. And uh, those cracks are going to get larger and larger and larger until the uh, 300-ish when uh, Constantine comes in and says, man, I've got to find some way of pulling this Roman Empire back together. How can I do that? Well, I had a religious experience when I won my big battle. I'm going to make Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. And suddenly everything turns upside down Suddenly, it's popular to be a Christian, probably the worst thing ever happened to the Christian church. Uh, but uh, up until that time, for, for a solid 200 years, John is the gospel that the apologists are going to go to to demonstrate that Christians are good citizens. John, or, uh, Jesus will have none of this, uh, you're, you're in the world but not of the world, so therefore go build a monastery. Uh, Jesus says, you're in the world and you're going to pay your taxes. Uh, you're in the world and you're going to do what your authorities say that you're going to do. Uh, and John provided uh, the, the perfect springboard from which to defend. I'm a good Roman citizen. I just have religious qualms about saying the things and taking the oaths that you want me to say and to take. And so John served another purpose. Whether he had that in mind when he wrote his gospel, I, I don't have any idea. Uh, yeah, comment. <laughs> Excellent point. Even if John didn't have that in mind, God did. Uh, amazing how he provides for us, isn't it? So let's take a quick look through John's prologue. I did a, a one-off class on this probably a couple of years ago uh, when we had a, a gap somewhere. Uh, so if, if you remember that, pardon me for, for doing the review, but uh, the word is hologos, uh, uh, logos from which we get logic uh, and, and all of our related uh, terms that have to do with that. Uh, but it's so much more than just the concept of, of the logical entity. Uh, 600 years, actually, close, by the time John writes this, closer to 700 years of Greek thought go into this concept of the word, the logos. Uh, it starts with, of all people, Pythagoras, whom we tend to think of as a mathematician, uh, the founder of geometry. And, um, but he, 
he would take umbrage at that. He was a philosopher, and it, really he was a theologian in, in his mind at the very least. What he did was look at the, uh, the, the Greek pantheon, uh, Zeus and Hera and all those different gods. He, he looked at that whole system, and he said, yeah, I'm, I am faithful to that religious system, but there's nobody there who could have created this. We have all kinds of creation stories, and none of them involve these gods. So what force did create uh, this? And he didn't name uh, that force, but he said there's a reason why the stars move in predictable ways. Uh, there's a reason why the sun comes up in the east every morning and sets in the west. There's a reason why there is order and elegance and beauty to the universe, and the reason is the gods we worship didn't create it. <laughs> Because they're all too busy chasing, uh, you know, human, uh, good-looking human women. Uh, and they just take, none of them have the gravitas to have made this world. So next generation, a guy named Heraclitus comes along and puts a name to it. He says, yes, there is a force that pervades the universe. It's called the Logos. It's the organizing force that keeps everything running in spite of the vagaries of the, uh, the Greek uh, pantheon, and and then it just developed beyond that. Uh, Socrates has some of his uh, uh, dialogues uh, focusing on this idea. Uh, Plato and Aristotle both uh, run with it in different directions, and by the time John comes along in the late first century, this is a very well-developed concept. There wouldn't have been anybody who had done any reading anywhere at any time in the late first century culture of uh, the Roman Empire who would not be familiar at least with the term o logos as an organizing and empowering force that runs through the universe. Uh, and so John just does a shorthand here. He says, in the beginning was that force that you guys have been talking about for the last 600 years. And the force was with God and the force was God. And uh, there's only one God and that's him. And he came to earth. Uh, the, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory is the unique son of God. Um, all of that, John takes this great, deep, and well-inculcated history, uh, philosophical history, and takes it, just, just drops it right in where it needs to be. Uh, God's spirit is really good with words. And so... Uh, so with this shorthand, with this introduction, he's able to take all of this thought and say, yeah, that's all right, but here's what you don't know that you need to know. He came to earth. He's, he lived among us. We walked around with him. We heard him say things that we didn't fully understand until after he left and his spirit opened our eyes. Um, we, we know that this is how the universe works. If you, if you want to ask deep philosophical questions, go ahead and ask them, then go to John. And John will answer them for you and put them in a theological context that is universal, and that is eternal, and that is absolutely unshakably right. It's just a great place to land with this. So, uh, the word is both with God and God. Aristotle didn't like that. Plato was comfortable with it. Uh, by the way, if you want a, a 20th century uh, correlate to this concept of logos, I've already used the word force. Uh, George Lucas, uh, in his Star Wars movies, talks all about the force. Oh, the force runs throughout all living things, and, and uh, you know, yada, yada. Well, that's very Buddhist. Uh, that's a Buddhist application of that. But the language is actually, as long as you'll let go of some of that uh, inanimate stuff, the language is pretty good for describing the relationship between humans and the creation and the creator. So you can take George Lucas's philosophy up to a point, and then you got to release it as, as thinly veiled Buddhism. Uh, but the, the idea of a pervasive force is not a bad place to start from as long as you'll read jo uh, John and, and get the rest of the, of the story. Word is both with God and word is God. Word became flesh. That's critical. No other world religion 
has God coming down here and living with us as one of us. There's all kinds of legends of, of gods disguising themselves and coming down just to see what it was like to live on earth. But at no point did they come and be physically human. That's the other thing that John will not let go of. Jesus is both perfectly God and perfectly human. It's another one of those things that makes Aristotle turn over in his grave. You can't be both, but he is. <laughs> and, and John really reinforces that idea. Uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwell there means he just kind of came into the neighborhood and pitched his tent. It's literally tabernacled with us. And so he was one of us. He was right in our midst when he, when he got a cut, when his dad was teaching him how to be a carpenter. He bled. He perspired when it was hot. He was shaking when it was cold. He was one of us. Really important. You can get that from the synoptics, but you get it so much faster with John and so much more directly. Here's a really important point. No one has ever seen God. Is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart who has made him known? John's Gospel is all about if you want to know God, and we all do in some form or another, if you want to know God, look at Jesus. He's one of us, and yet he shows us clearly, plainly, without clouds or fog or, or distortion of any sort, he shows us who God is, how we ought to interact with him, and how we can come to him. And that's really the critically important piece uh, of this prologue, is God reached out to us in the only way that was effective, by putting, see my language is going to fail me now, I started to say by putting a piece of him here that is not accurate. <laughs> he himself was here walking the earth while he himself was still God in heaven, whatever that means, okay? Uh, we don't have adequate language to talk about this, and yet John's going to talk about it, and that's what we're going to spend our time with. So we've got a couple of minutes where if you've got things you want to talk about, we can talk about them. Terry, go ahead. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Terry's point is exactly on task. When we get to the very end of the Gospel of John, uh, and, and we look at the stories that John has told that are not in the synoptics, he says, there's still more. <laughs> there's a lot more stories. Uh, the, the world doesn't have enough libraries to hold all the other stories, uh, but these were told so that you might believe, and in believing that you might have eternal life, right? Okay, it's a wonderful, wonderful gospel, and a great place to spend our time. I'm looking forward to... Uh, Troy doing this through the uh, uh, through the sermon. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, Ben's point is that uh, the, the Gospels still serve unique purposes, and if you bump into a seeker who's got a couple of uh, sets of initials after his name and thinks of himself as being a deep thinker, John is a good one to, to lay on his doorstep. It'll keep him busy, it'll keep him thinking, it'll keep him challenged, uh, no matter how smart uh, he is or thinks he is. Uh, John will challenge him and John will inform 
uh, his best, deepest, uh, broadest thoughts. Had a hand over here? Yes, Tom. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, that's an excellent point. John in his epistles uh, doesn't sugarcoat much, <laughs> does he? Come on, you guys. <laughs> what are all these divisions about? Your number one job is to love one another. Yeah, he becomes more emphatic in his old age, uh, and I'm glad he got emphatic. Some of us need a good, you know, head slap every now and then. Not me, of course. I'm got that all under control, but uh, other, yes, Art. A God, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Art's point is that missing the uniqueness of Jesus, the one and only Son of God, and radically different as a result of that from any of us, is to miss the entire point of not just the Gospel of John, but the entire Bible. The whole Bible is focused on that focal point that is when Jesus came to earth and pitched his tent among us and was us and yet decidedly not us. And we are thankful he's decidedly not us because otherwise he wouldn't have made the perfect gift uh, in our stead, the perfect sacrifice for us. But yeah, there's a lot of thinkers out there and frankly non-thinkers too uh, who, who want to kind of level the playing field. Yeah, Jesus was a great teacher. Uh, he was... Uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God, lowercase g, uh, and, and therefore you all can be gods too. Uh, if you just aspire to your highest uh, uh, whatever, uh, you, can, you can be as good as Jesus. No, you can't. <laughs> you can be cleansed by Jesus, but you will never be as good as Jesus. Is that okay? Sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go yeah 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 ben's point is is well taken if you've got somebody who wants to turn that into uh, a god lowercase g then just ask them how many times they've walked on water uh, yeah, there, there's something radically different about Jesus, and uh, John is filled with those. And by the way, he doesn't call them miracles ever. Uh, most of them are works, and we'll get into this uh, another couple of weeks. Uh, the really significant ones, the one that John wants you to really point out, are called signs. First sign comes two weeks from now in a little town called Cana. So you'll have something to look forward to. Uh, we're ready to wrap up. Thank you for your participation, and we look forward to uh, proceeding into the Word next week.